In 1999, yes, long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, it seems, huh? Uh, Dr. Paul Brand and Philip Yancey co-wrote a book called Pain, The Gift Nobody Wants. What a great title, right? <laughs> the Gift That Nobody Wants. And Dr. Brandt was born in India to missionary parents, and they worked with uh, people that had leprosy. And, and so through the process of of working with them, one of their discoveries was that, was that the people who have leprosy do not have bad flesh that is just simply rotting away. The problem was the blood flow. The blood flow is, is restricted to certain parts of their bodies and their nerve endings end up dying off. And with that comes this sense, uh, they can't sense the danger to their bodies. In other words, lepers live pain-free. The stark reality is that this absence of pain was the greatest enemy to the leper. They found out the lepers in the morning, sometimes their fingers would be like gnawed off. Why? Because the rats would come in in the evening and the, at night and they couldn't feel that to swish the rats away and they would chew on their hands. Pretty scary stuff. But Dr. Brandt also knew that the lepers often went blind. Why? Because they didn't blink. And the body's designed that when the eyes start drying out, to blink. And they didn't feel that pain when their eyes were drying out. So to solve the problem, he surgically attached the chewing muscle to their eyelids and then taught them how to chew gum. Interesting, fascinating how God has made the body, that God made even those pain and the sufferings to be kind of a natural alarm clock going off uh, for us to get our attention. And C.S. Lewis put it this way, God whispers in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world, but instead of listening in the times of suffering, we're often asking the questions. We're saying, oh, Lord, why is there suffering in this world? Why is this happening to me? How could a powerful and loving God allow these things to happen in my life right here, right now? And those are real questions We've all asked at times. And we can note that God's word has solutions for our sufferings, telling us the progress through the pain, and so it's wise for us to listen up. And some of you may be in a place of real suffering, whether it's physically or whether it's emotionally or whatever it might be. And so it's good to hear God's word and to heed God's word that he wants to strengthen you in those times. So we're going to look at today why we suffer. We're going to look at uh, what does suffering produce in me and through my life? And then how I can walk wisely through the suffering. And so Proverbs chapter 15, verse 15 is where we want to start. And we read there, All the days of the afflicted are evil, but he who is of a merry heart has a continual feast. That suffering is painful. It's perplexing and confusing. It's, it's called evil there or made evil. In the Amplified Version, it says they're made evil by anxious thoughts and forebodings. They hurt. No one goes through their day and wakes up and says, boy, I sure hope I suffer today. We don't do that. It's not something we welcome and say, oh, please, God, let me suffer. It's not how we're geared. But it does happen in various ways in life. In fact, there are really five arenas of where we see suffering take place in life. The first is a general suffering, what you would call trials. We all know those things. At the fall, when, we, when sin entered the world, so did suffering and pain and problems, as we looked at last week. And even all creation, all that God has created is under this umbrella of trials and suffering. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 20 and 21 says, For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. So someday things will change when Jesus comes to rule and reign, but until then, trials and sufferings just happen. You think about the cancers, you think about a house that's destroyed by a natural disaster, or you wake up in the morning and you got a dead battery and a flat tire, or the famines in the world, whatever it is, 
You can't really say, well, they, they caused it, they deserved it. It just happens in life. Bad things happen. And Jesus dealt with one situation like that. In John chapter 9, there was a blind man. And the disciples came to Jesus and they said, Lord, who sinned, him or his parents? And Jesus said, he said basically, um, let me write it down here. Jesus said, neither, but that the works of God may be made known. In other words, he's saying the issue is not who or why. The issue is what is God wanting to do through this in the midst of the sufferings. And often we see pain and we just want to pass the blame on someone, even God, when things go bad. And we have to remember the world's not perfect. The world's fallen apart. It's under sin. It's not meant to be forever. But the Lord is still in control, and God can use those sufferings for His glory in our life. Look at Proverbs chapter 10, verse 25. When the whirlwind passes by, the wicked is no more, but the righteous has an everlasting foundation. In those trials, in those storms, in those whirlwinds that pass through, you have a foundation in Jesus that's going to last through the test of time. So the first arena of suffering is those general ones we call trials. The second arena would be the self-inflicted sufferings that come from the sinful desires that we have. We make bad choices. Maybe you're mismanaging finances. There's a, there's a consequence to that. You get angry and you get in a fight. That's a consequence. You fall to lust and you ruin a witness. It's a consequence. We see all these things as the Bible says that when we sow to the flesh, we reap destruction. There's a consequence. I remember as a kid, my mom went into the store. I was sitting out the car waiting for her. And uh, it was back in the day, was, and I don't even know if cars have them today, um, but there was, uh, there was a lighter there, you know, the lighter for cigarettes. And I pushed that puppy in. I think I was maybe eight, nine years old. Push that guy in, pops out, pull it out, and that's just glowing red. And I thought, wow, look at that. It's like a bug drawn to the light. So I took my thumb and I went, I wonder what happens burned it had a ring around my thumb there shoved that puppy back in there and just stuck it in my mouth mom comes out everything's fine I ain't gonna tell my mom what stupid choices you all hey you can laugh at me i can laugh at myself but you know you have stupid choices too but those are the self-inflicted type of sufferings uh, look at proverbs 11 verse 19 we read there as righteousness leads to life so he who pursues evil pursues it to his own death. That sin leads to death. Proverbs 18, 7 says, The mouth of fools are their undoing, and their lips are a snare to their very eye, lives. Proverbs 14, 17, A quick-tempered person does foolish things, and the one who devises evil schemes is hated. So we can see those self-inflicted sufferings that happen. Third arena would be the others inflicted sufferings that happen. It can be just as well as unjust. The unjust things we think about abuse that happens either physically or emotionally or even spiritually. Or if you've ever been cheated on or stolen from, that's a suffering that you go through where the innocent are taken advantage of. It may be a rebellious kid to a parent. That's an others inflicted suffering, even persecution for your faith. Jesus said, if they hated me, they're going to hate you too. And Paul would later write, those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. That's that reality that in following the Lord, we're going to suffer. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But that's an unjust suffering. We don't really deserve that. It's others-oriented that we don't deserve. But there is a just suffering that comes from others towards maybe you. You committed a crime. Guess what? You got thrown in the clink. There is a judgment. There is a sentence, maybe even a condemnation that happens there. Look at Proverbs chapter 10, verse 13. Wisdom is found on the lips of him who has understanding, but a rod is for the back of him who is devoid of understanding. <laughs> ah, Proverbs 19, 29, penalties are prepared for mockers and beatings for the backs of fools. So there are times when a physical punishment is the proper recourse for sin. The fourth arena of suffering, as we see that 
that it, this is true, there are God-directed sufferings in life. In two arenas, in discipline as well as in wrath. Now, the discipline is for his kids. Hebrews 11.6 tells us that whom the Lord loves, he chastens or disciplines. There's, there's, there's a suffering with that. It goes on to say that, that no, um, no discipline is pleasurable for the moment, but it's painful. But afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And so there is discipline in life, and there's sufferings that we go through that are a part of that. In fact, we can read in 1 Corinthians that the church there was not taking communion properly. And they experienced a suffering from the Lord. He said, some of you are sick and even die. That God would inflict a suffering upon his church as a disciplinary action? Yes. Look at Proverbs chapter 12, verse 1. Whoever loves instruction loves knowledge. But he who hates correction is what? Stupid. If you hate correction, it means you're stupid and prideful. But the second form of God-directed suffering would be the judgment, the judgment and the wrath of God that's poured out upon sin. We think about Sodom and Gomorrah. We think about the flood. We think about Revelation chapter 6 through 18, the wrath of God being poured out and people suffering because of that. So there is such a thing as a God-inflicted or God-directed suffering. Uh, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 23 says, The desire of the righteous is only good, but the expectation of the wicked is wrath. There's wrath coming. The fifth arena of suffering is what you would call satanic sufferings or warfare. And that deals with oppression, attacks against the faith and your witness. Uh, read the story of Job, the book of Job. We'll give you that. So these five areas, but then we run across this question, well, how do I know in the midst of my suffering how do I know why I'm suffering? As Proverbs 15, 15 said, that all the days are evil. I'm experiencing this. So the suffering I'm going through, is this, is this God's hand of discipline on me? Is this a trial of life? Is this the world just coming against me? Is it me making my stupid decisions? Is this just general trials? How do I discern where this is coming from? Too many times, people are quick to give the enemy credit for pain and problems in the world. Oh, it's the devil. He's hurting me. Well, maybe you stepped out of line and you just made a stupid decision in your flesh and God's letting you reel with the consequences. Nah, it's Satan. <laughs> no, maybe not. So how do I know? Well, here's, let me give you just some practical application. Number one, you start with examination. I bring my heart before the Lord and I say, Lord, just examine my heart. David said in Psalms uh, 139, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my, my intention. See if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Lord, here's my heart. Is there something in there? As I'm suffering in this situation, is there something I need to confess a, a sin to you, Lord? Proverbs 21 verse 2 says, Every way of man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the heart. So let God search you and reveal if there's something major there in the way. And then we confess that sin knowing he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us, right? But if in that searching, that nothing major comes to mind, then I really go to step two. After the examination becomes the dedication. Lord, I am all yours. As Paul says, I, I beseech you by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Lord, I am all yours. If you want me to go through this, then I'm going to trust you through this suffering. There's a dedication. And then thirdly, there is a comprehension understand what's taking place. You see, trials are this umbrella that we put over all the sufferings. And God wants to use that trial to draw you to him, while Satan wants to use the same trial and pull you away from the Lord, to question in your mind, to doubt his word, to make you bitter. And so how do I discern through these things? Well, l let me kind of clarify it. Trials are meant to prove my faith. It's a test. Spiritual attacks are meant to destroy my faith. God's discipline looks to restore my faith. And the self-inflicted sufferings and others' initiated sufferings 
look to ignore faith. It's all about feelings. Let me repeat that. Because this is how you discern that, those things. The trials are proving your faith. It's testing it. See how strong it is. The attacks are looking to destroy your faith. Question God's goodness. Has God indeed said, Satan said to Eve, doubt his word. They attack your faith. The discipline looks to restore you because he's a loving father wanting to correct you and and it wants to restore your faith. And the self-inflicted and others initiated looking to ignore faith completely and make it all about feelings. The Bible tells us, in one sense, that suffering does come from sin. It's affected the whole world. But we know that as believers, we will also suffer because we follow Christ. Philippians 3.10 says that I may know him and the fellowship of his sufferings, Paul said. Listen to 1 Peter chapter 4. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. And then he says in verse 19, so then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Would it ever be God's will for me to suffer? According to that verse, yes. And we read in Hebrews 11 about those who did suffer. They went through torments and they were destitute and they were killed with the sword and they, were, they went through famines and stuff and it says, and the world was not worthy of them. That's a great tagline, how God sees you and I in the midst of the sufferings we bear for Christ. So we embrace those sufferings rather than run from them because we know that what it ultimately does. So what does suffering do in me and for me? Well, there really is six gains to look at. The first is humility. The pain from the suffering brings you to your knees. It cuts down your pride. It shows you your frailty and need of God's help. If you've ever had physical suffering, you know that. It's you crying out to the Lord for help. I've dealt with a back issue for 30 years, and there's times when things just, you know, just seize up, and it's like, whoa, Lord, coming home. (laughs) That's how you feel. And you're leaning into the Lord. Lord, I just need your help. It brings a humility. You remember Paul had that thorn in the flesh? Really struggled with it in 1 Corinthians. He prayed three times, Lord, deliver me from this. And the Lord said, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. Because in your weakness, my power is made manifested. And Paul said, hey, I'm going to glory in this. The power of Christ rests upon me when I'm weak. He took the problem. He went to prayer. He made it a praise, knowing that God will be glorified in his weakness. In humility, look at Proverbs 11, verse 2. When pride comes, then comes shame, but with the humble is wisdom. Humility leads to wisdom. Proverbs 29, 23. Pride brings a person low, but the lowly in spirit gain honor. So is the suffering making me Humble, or is it hardening my heart towards the Lord? These are the gains. Number one is humility. Number two, godly character. Suffering purifies you. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold which perishes, even though refined by fire may result in praise, glory, and honor when Christ Jesus is revealed. In Romans chapter three, or chapter five, verses three through five. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So in suffering, I'm trusting the Lord. He's working in my character to build this godly character out of my life to be more like Jesus. The third gain we get in suffering, not only humility and godly character, the third one is a boldness to share the gospel. It really, the suffering ignites a fire for the Lord. Look at 2 Timothy 1.8. 
So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Paul's writing to Timothy. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. When you know your life's in his hands and those sufferings happen, it actually can ignite you to say, you know what? I'm going home pretty soon, and so I want others to know about Jesus. We've all had friends maybe suffering through cancer, and it's like it lit a fire in them to say, hey, man, my life's, it's almost over, so I'm going out with a blaze of glory for Jesus. It's a good thing. Look at Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. It's a wise thing to do, to be bold for Jesus. The fourth game, there's effectiveness in ministry to others. That suffering makes me relatable. Look at 2 Corinthians 1.4. Who comforts us, speaking of God, comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. There is compassion and sympathy for others in pain when you've experienced suffering too. We're in his hands. We are his hands and feet to reach others. Number five, suffering gives me a reward in heaven. Rightly, when I suffer rightly, it leads to rewards eternally. Matthew 5, 11 and 12. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So there's comfort in knowing I'm in this with others. They've, I'm not alone, and God is going to reward me in the end when I'm suffering for the Lord. And number six, there's a great testimony to others. Suffering takes God's promises from just my head knowledge of who He is to bring it out into a real practical reality in my life. Look at Psalms 119.71. It was good for me, the psalmist writes, to be afflicted so that I might learn your decrees. And hindsight always brings that perspective, right? I know God's word is true, not just because I sat in a class and sat in a church service, because I've seen it lived out in my life, the reality of who God is. And Paul would write about the church in 2 Thessalonians, that he commended them for their sufferings, that all the world knew what this church was going through. James would write about Job and his sufferings, how it became an example in James chapter 5 of God's patience and his mercy for us. So there's lots to learn. So those six gold medals, so to speak, that we can gain through suffering, knowing that prize, though, what does suffering do, what suffering does in me, then I want to be able to say, how can I walk wisely through the sufferings of life? How can I walk right, wisely? Well, look again at Proverbs 15, verse 15 again. As it says, all the days of the afflicted are evil, but it says, but he who is of a merry heart has a continual feast. So in the midst of the sufferings, I can have those two things. I can have a merry heart and a continual feast. How? Well, let me tell you how. Number one is through knowing God's Son. The book of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews chapter 12, to consider him, Jesus, consider Jesus who endured such hostility from sinners lest you become weary and discouraged in your own souls. I can have a merry heart when I fix my eyes upon who Jesus is and what he went through for me. I can have a merry heart that comes by not only knowing God's son personally, but knowing God's plan intimately, that where is all this leading to? Ultimately, I'm going to be in heaven. As Romans 8 says, the sufferings of this world are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to come. And I can know God's plan intimately. I can know God's word daily, a continual feast through the sufferings that even when my physical body is suffering or my soul is kind of famished, I have God's word to go back to and feed on, to be strengthened. I can say, like Psalms 23 says, you prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And I can have that feast. You know, when I, when I do funerals, one of the things that I like to do 
as a person that's finished kind of that, that race, is I like to get their Bible, if they're a believer. I like to get their Bible and just peruse through it. I want to see what God was speaking to their hearts in these last days. I want to see over the past year what notes they had and what highlights, because it gives me a peek into how they were eating, what they were eating on, what they were chewing, and it's such a sweet thing. So I encourage you, as you read, write. As you read, highlight. And feast on the Lord's goodness. Look at Proverbs 24, verse 10. I can not only have a merry heart and continual feast, but I can have a right assessment of myself. Proverbs 24, 10. If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. Suffering reveals how strong I am spiritually. It proves me, it tests me. It's like taking a test in school. It's, it's meant to show what's really there. And sometimes we can be all talk until suffering comes, right? Can I walk the walk? I love what John Corson says. He says, our moaning and crying is not an indication of the heaviness of our burden, but the weakness of our backs. Let that sink in. We often, that's what happens. I'm complaining not because of how hard things are. It really shows me how strong my back is. It's not really that strong. And so we go through those things. So God's Word not only tells us why we suffer and what it brings to my life, all those gains. It shows me how to get through it victoriously. It is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. But I want to give you, lastly, the wise path through suffering, these are seven Ps, okay? How do I get through this all in one piece? How do I get through this and come out the other side as gold glorified? Let me give you these things. Number one, you've got to gain his perspective that God is in charge. It was Job's wife who said to him, why don't you just curse God and die? Not a good support, right? And Job said, naked I came from the womb, and naked I will return. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's a perspective in the midst of the pain. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says, my ways are not your ways, neither are my thoughts your thoughts, says the Lord. That's a perspective to take. And even as Romans 8 says, the sufferings of this world are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to come. That's a perspective. And pain makes us lose perspective. It makes us forget that here is not eternal, here is temporary. That comfort is not my calling. I'm calling home. Heaven is where I'm going. It makes us lose perspective. And we have to remember that God is still in charge even when it hurts. Number two, I need to acknowledge his presence. God is with you. Jesus, as he left the disciples, said to them in that last commission, for lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He is with you. Psalms 23 says, we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will not fear, for you are with me. Isaiah 43 says in verse 1 and 2, though you pass through the fire and through the water and the floods, they will not over, overwhelm you, for I am with you. It's not a matter of if the suffering will happen, but when. And God says he will be with you. His presence will never leave you or forsake you. Number three, I go to prayer. And I realize God is listening. James chapter 5 says, if any of you are suffering, any of you are sick, pray. That's the directive. It says even to call the elders of the church and anoint him with oil and the prayer of, of faith will raise him up. There's prayer. Philippians 4, look at this one. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every th situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And too often when we face the sufferings, we start to get anxious. We start to worry about the future and how's this going to unfold and this, that, and the other. And it's like the Lord says, you've got to settle down. Pray. I'm listening. You've got to pray. Prayer is that pathway to peace. Number four, I got to receive his peace. Recognize that God is guarding you. 
Even as Philippians 4, 7 says, And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We want to understand peace. But the Bible says it's going, to, it's going to be beyond your comprehension or your ability to understand. It's just a peace that's going to guard your heart. But I don't understand it. Because <laughs> it's God's. We want to understand it so that we can control it. When the Lord says, no, you're the kid, not the parent. I'm in charge. I'm listening to your prayers. I want to give you my peace. As John 14, 27, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. So God's peace is not the absence of conflict. It's a strength in the midst of the conflict. It's like being in a very stinky room and opening the window and fresh air comes in. It's what we need. Number five, we need to exercise patience when we're suffering because God is still working. Listen to what the writer of Hebrews told in chapter 10. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insults and persecution. At other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had a better and lasting possession. This is what these people were going through as they stood for Christ. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. Hey, it's natural when we are suffering to look for the way out of it rather than the way through it. But it's by faith that we say, Lord, take me through this. I need patience, and I need you to work as you intend. Number six, hold on to his promise, because God is good. Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. That's victory for us. A promise of victory because God is good. And number seven, I need to remember his plan, that God has a glorious end that is coming. And here's this verse, Romans chapter 8. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. What's God's goal in your life? To make you into the image of his son. He uses the good, the bad, and the ugly in life to mold us that way. Listen, things may not be good in my eyes, but they do work a good end for the glory of God as I'm following Him. And I want to leave you with one last scripture. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10 and 11. And the God of all grace tells me that He's a favorable God. Who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, it tells me his plan, him in Christ, after you have suffered, that's our reality, a little while, it's temporary, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm and steadfast. That he is personally involved in what he said. His promise is true, also that we can say to him, be power forever and ever. Amen.